right, guys. So I've gotten uh, heard a lot of people asking kind of about how uh, Demois, Demois theorem really works and like graphing, graphing uh, imaginary and complex numbers in polar versus uh, Cartesian planes because it's it gets a little odd. So I'm gonna actually talk about a little bit of history to kind of give a background so that you can kind of get out of the I don't want to say a rut, but after taking only like Algebra 2 and things like that, you're kind of used to a certain idea of how uh, graphing works. So I'm going to talk about the history of that because I have read a few books on how imaginary numbers work and the history of that. So I'm going to talk about that real quick. I just want to say if anyone else is interested in the books, I don't know if anyone wrote theirs, but if you do, uh, the first one that was most, the most applicable was called An Imaginary Tale by Paul J. Nahin. I um, guess it's on Amazon, so I got it. And the second one, which is probably a little advanced because has a bunch of calculus in it, um, a bunch of kind of weird stuff, is this Dr. Euler's Fabulous Formula. And it's a little less applicable. It's not as much history. It's more cool applications. But if you're interested, you can look at it. So it's going to sound kind of cheesy going back to the origins of math, what the origins were, or technically the origins were like counting sheep and stuff like that. But actual like the science of mathematics began with the Greeks and they pretty much only did geometry things they looked at relationships not really necessarily algebra like we look at examples of what I mean by that is with things like triangles they looked at the fact that it has three sides and the relationships between those three sides like an equilateral triangle all the sides are the same or where like certain centers are if you draw a circle around or inside of a triangle uh, we talked a little bit about that in freshman geometry, but it's not super important. Uh, and other things were, this is the pentagram, it's, it's not satanic, or it is satanic, but it's not its use. It was also the insignia of the Pythagorean cult that existed in the Greeks, and they liked it because it had to do with the golden ratio, which you may have heard of, which is the ratio between this side and this side, but I could be wrong. So the, the original idea of geometry was to look at relationships. Uh, when you got, get to the 16th century and a guy named Rene Descartes, who we all know about from Cartesian plane, he comes up with this idea called algebraic geometry, which is basically just using graphs, which is what we see as most of algebra. Uh, so he was able to show shapes not as like abstract things where they had certain relationships, but instead as combinations of functions that had certain values and certain ways to calculate different values to give a certain shape. Okay, these are really bad drawings, but then after that, after a few hundred years of evolution of algebraic geometry, people figured out that you could use this to plot pretty much any pair of points and use it as another way to look at the algebraic relationships, which is the whole value of graphing. Like if you look at statistics, if you look at economics, you look at pretty much anything, things are modeled using functions and functions can be better seen not like by the way you write them because that's hard to tell but if you look at a graph of them it's really obvious to see trends so people found uh, mathematicians found different ways to graph like obviously you had the original Cartesian plane they came up with the uh, polar uh, coordinate system and three-dimensionally there are actually three different uh, coordinate systems but we won't talk about that but all of you except maybe Max will of course, recognize this definition. I don't need to tell you what it is from the uh, great J.T. Sutcliffe from last year. Uh, this is the idea of a function, but I have to tell you what it is. But so a function is not necessarily it. It can be seen. You can see that something's a function by doing the vertical line test on a graph, but it's not necessarily how what a function is. A function is a certain equation that maps x onto y and graphing is just a way to visualize it. So graphing isn't necessarily exclusive to functions. It's just a very, very universally useful tool for functions and the rest of algebra and pretty much all of math. So where am I going with all this? Uh, we already know a lot of the stuff I've actually already said about math and about history, but we get start getting into complex numbers, which were a very, a relatively new topic in math. They've only been around for, or accepted by mathematicians for about 200, 250 years, I think. Uh, some of the pioneers were people like Demoivre. Um, 
And actually, in the search form actually began in finding roots of polynomials because, as you know, things like x squared plus 1 has zero real roots, but we still want to find the roots, the actual roots. That's where you need i and negative i. Uh, so, and this was related to graphs. Like if you graph x squared plus 1, the roots are imaginary, but it never actually crosses the x-axis. So this is why it took people a long time to accept them as real, and they're actually still not quite real. So they're imaginary. So after the very long process of people accepting this, they ended up being actually very useful because they could be used to solve things like this. And in that first book, An Imaginary Tale, it, there are probably 150 pages of different actual applications to real-world problems that involve imaginary numbers. So once the application of uh, the imaginary number square root of negative one i was understood, people wanted to learn a lot more about it because as you learn more about it, you could do pretty much anything with most polynomials that was really important in math. So obviously they had to figure out a new way to find like square roots and cube roots and things like that of complex numbers because you may not, if you remember, uh, this was one of the first Tristan's principles from last year, the square root of a complex number, and it's this really ugly expression, and that's not really practical, and it's only for square roots. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of cool to look at, but that's about it. So they had to come up with really creative and really new ideas to find square roots, cube roots, fourth roots, all of that stuff. So we get to Dumois' theorem. So Dumois' theorem essentially, as bare minimum, calculates this, which is, if you remember from a few days ago, it's the same thing as kiss or sis or whatever. Uh, so it calculates this to any power, and it's a really complicated proof to why this works. And in the second book that I show, there's about four, four or five pages dedicated to just proving this progressively. But we get to that. And that is Dumois' theorem, or, and that becomes incredibly, incredibly useful in what we're doing. So now we get to stuff that's on the homework. So when we're graphing this, as Ms. Poole showed in her notes, it's important to remember that graphing isn't necessarily exclusive to functions, as I talked about. Graphing is simply a way to show uh, visually like trends and things like that. And it's useful for functions, that's all we've really done, but you can't limit yourself to just that. So when we get to, this is the complex plane that she talked about, where we have I on this axis and real numbers on this axis. Um, so if we were to plot, again, this is a sort of graph. It's not the same as a function. It's not y and x. It's reals and imaginaries. And everything in here is the complex realm. So if we were to plot any complex number as a point, then we could put it, say, here. So this number, it's not, you don't write it as a coordinate pair like a comma b, right? That would be the same as uh, having a, it's not a function, you don't write it in this sort of notation. Instead, you write it like that because it's a number, it's not a pair of points. So as in, this is probably the most important idea that you have to understand that it is numbers and not a set of points because it applies to the whole idea of complex numbers and complex realms and roots and Dumois theorem and all of that. That's what makes Dumois theorem so, so useful and so efficient at finding roots. So to start by explaining more how to actually plot numbers, uh, we draw this unit circle uh, and instead of uh, having a function x squared plus y squared equals 1, 
to express this if this says that every point on this circle has the absolute value or excuse me every number every number on this circle has the absolute value or modulus as we talked about uh, I think a few months ago it was on a homework question kind of randomly with the absolute value a plus b i and if you remember this value is equal to the square root of the sums of the squares of the coefficients so it's a squared plus b squared like that these are all equal to one so the distance of this number from the number zero is one so you get a circle so now if we want to use Dumois theorem we can look right here and hopefully everyone recognizes cosine theta or if, if you had a function and there was a point cosine theta comma sine theta it would always land somewhere on the unit circle well the same thing applies here if we have cosine theta plus i sine theta cosine theta is how far this way it goes and since it's the real number it's along the axis and i sine theta is how far it goes this way if the let me back up. If you have an angle like that, that's measured the same way you do on a unit circle from the positive real axis counterclockwise. And then if you have cosine theta as the real value, that would be right here, right? And if you had I, or if you had sine theta as the imaginary coefficient, Be right here so even though it's not necessarily a point this can correspond to a point dependent upon this angle and the same thing works if you add a coefficient in front of it so you add r r then you can just change that to r that's r times i that's negative r negative r i it's the same idea as with uh, a unit circle or an expanded unit circle it's just written in a different notation and it serves a different purpose as a number so this would represent the point r cosine theta plus i sine theta or as we've been doing in our homeworks and in the notes r cis theta. So there we go, that's how we graph a point. And I know a lot of people have been asking about uh, how do you graph it if it's a complex plane, don't you have to use it, use rectangular coordinates to graph it, not polar coordinates? Well, if you look at it, it's, it is the same way because in the previous chapter, or I guess we're still in the polar chapter, but we converted between polar and Cartesian coordinates and we got the same point. It's just a different way of expressing or writing or graphing the point. And it just gives you a certain mindset about how to think about the point. And you can graph this like a Cartesian by looking at the x value and the y value. That's what we would do if we did r cosine theta. That would be the real value, the x value. And that's this. And then we can do plus r i sine theta and that's the y or imaginary value and that's the same thing as going up there and you can do that but then you get into a little more ugly stuff because you have to actually evaluate cosine theta and sine theta and we're not always going to have angles that we can't use our calculators to find and when we do use our calculators we get really ugly decimals so it's kind of approximate but we can write it in this form because these are the same thing and it's a lot easier to write it like this because you can draw a circle or however you want to do it of radius r and move theta around the circle and it gives you the same point and it's more efficient and it's just a better way to do it but it still gives you the same point that's the idea that's similar to rectangular and polar coordinates being converted between each other. It's just a different way of writing and expressing it, but it's the same point.
Okay, so start to start as an example for Dumoulin's theorem, uh, I've given us just this number, 8645, which again can be written by converting it to this form and distributing the r. It can be written as 4 root 2 plus 4 root 2i. Remember that's the same number. I'm going to erase that for now. So if we were to graph this, I went ahead and uh, drew a unit circle with radius 2. You'll see why. Uh, it's kind of hard to graph because of the way I've drawn, but it would be, if we had a radius 8, it would be like way out here. And at 45 degrees, it would be like up here. Okay, let's put it like right there for now because I didn't think this through. But we have this point. So if we try to use Dumois theorem to find, say, the cube root, so cube root, say z, equals z to the one-third power. So we can go back to Dumas' theorem, see this value, this section, or cis theta, to any n power, the n will distribute to the theta. So if we apply the one-third power to this whole number, 8 cis 45 degrees, one-third. One-third will clearly distribute to the 8 normally. So and the cube root of 8 is 2. Yes, surprising. But then we get cis one-third times 45 degrees. This is where it gets useful. So, 2 cis 15 degrees. Okay, so if you want to write this in Cartesian coordinates, I'll show you. Even though 15 seems like a pretty reasonable value, you'd end up getting uh, root 6 plus root 2 what? over 2 plus root 6 minus root 2 over 2i. So if we were to graph this relatively simple value using Cartesian coordinates, we'd have to approximate about where these numbers are. That's kind of meh. Don't really want to do that. So we're just going to use the polar method. And remember, it's not the same as graphing a point. It's graphing a number using the same idea. So. This is why I drew a circle with radius 2. We already we see our radius here is 2. We already have that drawn. So we go 15 degrees, and we're still like a function. We're starting from this axis, the positive real axis. And we're going to rotate positive direction 15 degrees. So it's going to be, a, that's a bad, it's about right here. So 15 degrees, we get this point. That's is the cube root of z. But I did not forget this. If you remember, which you will because we home, this homework was assigned like three hours ago, um, this is not the only answer. And the reason why is because this is not the only way to write this number. You can write z in an infinite number of ways. Since you're using an angle, we can do cis 45 degrees plus 360 degrees n, where n belongs to a set of integers. So what this means is if you let n equal 0, you just get 45 degrees and we get this point again. Or if we let n equal 1, we go 45 degrees, then we go 360 and we still get the same point, right? But when we use to take the cube root, that doesn't become the same point anymore because this one third actually distributes to this part as well because this is part of the angle. Theta is whatever is in parentheses, whatever is the cis is taking as its input. So plus one third times 360 degrees n plus 
One third times 360 is 120. 120 degrees in. So this means that we have multiple points. So before they overlapped, but now they don't because 120 does not constitute enough to have sort of a polar period and go all the way around. So we can, if we let n equals zero, we get this point. But if we let n equal one, we get two cis 15 plus 120, 135 degrees. So that's a very different point. It still has the same radius. But instead of going 15, we're going to go 135. So it's about right here. Really ugly handwriting at that angle. But this is also cube root of z. And the angle between these two, I'm just going to get rid of that. The angle between these two is the difference, which is 120, because that's the change. 120 degrees, right? And then if we let n equal 2, we again get another point that is unique from these two. And we go another 120 degrees to 40, oh, 45, uh, 15 plus 240, we get 260. Yeah. 255 degrees. And that is around right here. Remember that 120 degrees. That is also the cube root of z. And if we go another 120, well, then we get back to where we started. Because 120 times 3 is 360, and that's all the way around. Which means that the next point will be here, and we won't get any new unique points. So we have three distinct cube roots. All right, so now to picture a more another important idea of Dumas theorem, we're going to do a general case where we just have variables uh, in the place of radius and theta, and we're just going to see what happens for any point. So to keep the idea of any point, we're going to raise this to be nth root instead of square root or cube root, because cube root, we already know, has two solutions. Square root, or cube root has three solutions. Square root has two solutions, as uh, you saw from my formula, which is ugly. Uh, but if we raise this to the 1 over n power, the nth root, we're going to investigate what happens there. So obviously, we get r to the 1 over n, which is some uh, probably ugly number. Uh, times the cis of 1 over n times theta. But that is not right, because that's not the whole answer. Just remember, 2 pi theta. OK, I'm going to change my variable since we have two n's. So let's change this to like k. So we're going to raise this to the k power, or the k root, just so we don't have two different n's. Because remember, this is the same point with any integer value of n, because it'll just go around the circle to the same spot over and over. But when we take the kth root, that sounds weird, 1 over k times theta plus 2 pi over k n. This is a. OK, there we go. Uh, so we're left with this when we take the general case. So our radius will be r to the 1 over k. And then our angle will be theta over k plus 
2 pi over k times n. So what does this what does this mean? So if we go over here, we imagine this is r to the 1 over k radius. Uh, and we'll just let k be, or theta be 0 right now. So the first point is right here, just to make it a little bit easier. So if we look at the second root that we're taking, or the, not the square root, the next root that we're taking. So if we let n equal 1, if we let n equal 1, our next root will be right here, and this angle will be 2 pi over k. Right? So then we let n equal 2. We have another. And this angle right here will be the same as 2 pi over k because that's the interval. But the angle from the original point will be 4 pi over k. And if we keep going, next point, interval is again 2 pi over k. But this whole angle is 6 pi over k. So if we keep going like this, we're looking for, once we get back to the angle being equivalent to 0 or 2 pi or anything like that, that is when we know we've run out of roots. So that means that we're looking for the value, or in this case, since we're letting theta equal 0, the value of 2 pi over k times n, where this is equal to 2 pi, because that is when we get back around the circle to not have any more unique roots. So we can easily solve this, where those cancel, those cancel, n over k equals 1, so n equals k. So what does this mean? That means when we get to n equals k, we'll no longer have a unique root. So how many roots do we have total? How many unique roots do we have total? Uh, well, we started with zero, right? And we went to one, two, three, four. And the last time that we had a unique root was k minus one, because the next time we're done. So if we go from zero to k minus one, uh, we can see through arithmetic that we have k roots. So this works for any case. This means that you take a complex number raised to one over any, I guess, yeah, we're just going to do integers for now, but uh, fifth root, 17th root, 2,566th root, that'll have 2,566 unique roots because there will be 2,566 unique points along the circle. So this is the idea that Dumoulin's theorem uses. It is able to convert what we usually think of as a very kind of algebraic idea of a root, what number we can multiply by, into segments on a circle, which is really kind of weird and different to think about, but it's incredibly useful. And it's honestly pretty cool that we can visualize it like this, because this does work if I think number one on the homework uh, had you uh, do that, where you can use DeMoss theorem to find a cube root of something and convert it to rectangular coordinates, then you cubed it again, and you get the original value. So the same idea works here, where all of these are applicable roots. So now I'm going to do a, another small fun example. It's not really useful, but if you want to stick around and see what I do, then. All right, so we all know that one times one equals one, right? So the square root of one is one. What are other square roots of one? Well, if we look at, if we kind of just quickly use Dumas theorem in our head, we can think that, okay, we have ones right here, if we're doing the square root, then they're going to be two distinct roots, right? And they'll be on an equal interval throughout the circle. And the way you divide 2 pi radians, or 360 degrees, 
in half by going halfway. So the other root will be right here. Negative 1. And negative 1 times negative 1 does equal 1. So there you go. But now what? What else can we do? So now just for fun, let's try to find all the fifth roots of 1. We know that 1 is obviously one of them, but what else is there? So, and we're going to find them in a plus bi just to see what kind of weird stuff we can get because it looks kind of cool like that. So we don't even really need to write out the Lamas theorem for this. Ugly circle. So here's one. And we know the radius is going to stay at one because we're given this one point. Square root of one is one or negative one, but that's the same magnitude. So we start with one. Now we rotate 2 pi over 5. So that takes us to about here, which gives us cis 2 pi over 5. Next spot is cis 4 pi over 5. Next spot is cis 6 pi over 5. And we have cis. 8 pi over 5. Now we're back to 1. So these are our five points. So the fifth root of 1 equals 1, comma, cosine 4 pi over. No, I start with that one. 2 pi over 5 plus i sine. So now I'm going to use a calculator to actually find these numbers because I don't know how to do that algebraically. So we have these five numbers, and they look kind of random, but using the Moss theorem, we have shown that if you multiply them by themselves five times, you get one, which is kind of cool. So that is it. Thank you for sticking around for the fun part. This is the fun part. Uh, good luck on your homework.